Good afternoon, everybody. Um, this is the session where we will talk about leading while pivoting through uncertainty, um, how to restore uh, faith and confidence and trust in leaders. What have these people who are here on board uh, today in the panel, what have they seen happening uh, during the COVID period in terms of leadership skills? Where were the risky parts in leaders, where did they flourish? And is there any predictability on that one as well? So um, without further ado, we will start this meeting. Everybody is on board here. We have a really competent uh, group of panelists and I'm very honored and happy uh, to, to facilitate this session. Um, Nina, could I um, ask you to come first to tell us in like two, three minutes the essentials of what you have been witnessing as a life coach over the past period. And then all the other speakers will speak for two, three minutes uh, before having a flowy conversation like a fire chat talk. Nina, please go ahead. Thank you so much, Simon. Thank you so much for having me. So as a life coach and facilitator, I help leaders to embrace uncertainty and change, right? Exactly what you were saying. COVID is, you know, there was so much uncertainty. And what I want to remind all of us of on this call is that life is a series of change. There's always uncertainty. There's always, always uncertainty and there will always be uncertainty. Maybe your partner will leave you. Maybe you'll be laid off. Maybe your business is going to be bankrupt, right? Maybe there's going to be a virus spreading across the globe. And you can either lead the change and be proactive or you can react to the change. And this is what I know to be true by working with so many leaders is that if you wait for change to happen, it will happen to you. But if you use it as a fuel, if you try to kind of ride the wave of change, then you can have it happen for you, right? So the biggest power you have as a leader is your decision-making power your ability to respond. This is where resilience comes in. I believe that the best leaders that have handled this crisis are the ones that understood how to master uncertainty and how to practice resilience. And you can practice resilience from within. Right? Anything that happens to us in life, you know, on the external side, is just the circumstance. It's just what is. I love the quote by, Mar by Marcus Aurelius, who says that if you're distressed by anything that external, the pain that you experience is not due to the thing itself, not due to the circumstance, but to your estimate of it, right? And this, you always have the power to remove. This, you always have the power to respond, right? The circumstances are just neutral, and that anything you do as a leader and how you think and how you feel and how you act, this is up to you. And I think for the leaders I work with, I really saw the difference during this uncertain time of COVID. They were responding, the ones that were responding from within, the ones that accepted reality as is, that went to the worst case scenario, made peace with it, are the ones that the most resilient, are the ones that showed up with compassion, with um, ideas, with scenarios where they could be the best leaders, right? It doesn't seem sometimes that the choices that we make, um, you know, in the moment will lead to the result that we want. But if we stay grounded, if we understand how to process our emotions, how to manage our minds, this is when we become the best leaders. So it's always what story are you creating? What you know, drama are you creating in your mind? And I always ask my, my clients, I was like, where do you want to be in three months from now? How are you going to be more of yourself? How are you going to be the best version of yourself throughout this crisis? Are you choosing to be the victim or can you mm -hmm, decide mm -hmm. to be more of a leader and lead by example? Okay, thanks so much. Well, that uh, was a very clear introduction. And um, um, yeah, thanks so much. So it's uh, uncertainty, how to deal with uncertainty. It's about resilience. It's about uh, defining yourself as a leader, your response um, proactively. So, Jose, um, what did you 
encountered the past, say, 18 months, more or less, in terms of leadership and how to react to it? Jose, oh, can you hear us? Here I go. I was, ah, I there you go. Okay. I was muted, but I'm not muted anymore. Well, we, we, we see you in the dark, but we know you're there. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's the lighting of my room. I am like him. Oh, uh, these, these things, these these things, things, things happen. happen. We all know. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Anyway, well, hopefully you can hear me at least. Yes, I, we well, can hear you. Thank you, Simone, for your for your invitation and your introduction. Um, I think that uh, what I have seen, uh, and uh, I work in the somehow in the financial sector because we we do uh, investments and. Obviously, there's always the issue of the black swans and the uncertainty coming up and so forth. To me, what uh, along the lines of Nina, I think that the most important thing I have seen is that you have to accept uncertainty. You have not only to accept, but to recognize that you are immersed in uncertainty. That even when times think totally uh, under control, it's just a perception. It's just a perception. You are not really in any certain environment, uh, because this changes from one day to the other. And I think that people first of all to recognize this fact because um, the human mind tends to stick to certainties. They tend to think that when things go in one direction, they will continue to go in one direction. If uh, technology companies are going north, it's because there is a fundamental reason why they are gaining momentum and that will never change. Uh, and the opposite is true. There are things that will go wrong because they're wrong. Um, and the reality is not that. The reality is that things change continuously and you have to be ready to accept that what you think is not right, that the certainty you have is not real. It's just a perception of, of, of certainty that will not hold uh, forever. Um, and in order to, to navigate in this kind of like situation, first of all, uh, as I said, you have to you have to basically disrupt your mental schemes and start to think that one, no matter what you do today, you have to foresee them foreseen. Um, I remember, this is an anecdote, but one extra of us asked me in a meeting, what are the unexpected events you, you think are going to happen now on? And I said, well, if they were unexpected, uh, <laughs> I would not expect them. So I don't expect anything unexpected. Uh, that's kind of like the trick, okay? Um, so you keep you know, an open mind. Exactly. You have to, open, to keep an open mind. The second thing you have to do, obviously, is to hedge the uncertainties. You have to understand, or at least try to understand, and this is mostly based on experience. I think that if you have had in the past uh, events of, of any type, you have to apply what you learned there for the, new, for the new road ahead. And you have to basically understand that, for example, if you think things are going to be forever in one direction, and they're not going to be. Therefore, you should take your actions now to to prevent these new scenarios. You have to live through basically the different parallel worlds you will have to potentially see and create a kind of like set of of decision okay. of decisions that will basically protect you as much as you can in this environment. This is basically it. Okay. Thanks so much. Yeah, very clear. So nothing is ever under control. So we have to kind of embrace the uncertainties all the time. And uh, yeah, that's, that's a good one. If you would know the unexpected, it wouldn't be unexpected anymore, right? Um, Tate, um, you're working on, among others, on war gaming and different scenario building kinds of games um, online. So um, could you tell us a little bit about, uh, uh, because there are lots of uncertainties there, of course, there's a lot of leadership needed, and but also I would be interested to hear what kind of different reactions do you see of leaders and what do you make of it? Sure. Um, yeah, so I have spent the last 25 years or so doing scenario planning and wargaming, which is, sounds very provocative and very... And, um, yeah. For sure. Sort of, yeah, but, but in reality, it's a methodology. You can call it strategy gaming. You can call it policy gaming. But the idea um, is to, because I think we probably have all seen, even before COVID, although COVID revealed it uh, probably more starkly than we would have liked, a sort of lack of imagination uh, sometimes among leadership. And I think there are incentives and instincts that leaders accrue as they become leaders 
um, that kind of dampen imagination. And, and that's a general statement I recognize. It's not true of everyone. But, but, but methodologies like scenario planning, where you start to focus not just on the probable or preferred, but on the possible and the plausible, you know, kind of expand analytic filters in a way that allows you, I think, more easily to incorporate the uncertainty that we see in the world and complexity that we see in the world. So, so I think that these are really important methodologies that, that I know that some, at least in the corporate world, they've started to seep in um, into strategic planning. Um, Wargaming, probably less so uh, than scenario planning because it comes out of the military environment. But the idea is you take these scenarios and you actually play them out. You act them out. You have individuals uh, role play how they would respond given, you know, uh, uh, under certain circumstances. And what you learn, I think, uh, and at least I've noticed this, what leaders tend to learn by participating in these is where the trade-offs and tensions are uh, in their decision making. So if we take uh, path Y, if we make this decision, they see you know, over the course of the exercise, which may last a day, it may last a week, it depends on how much time you have, um, what the consequences of those decisions are. And and I think the more you get leaders to participate in these exercises, instead of just listening to how they went, they get to see in a visceral way that, hey, these are where, you know, we, we didn't see that that would be the third order consequence of our decision. Um, boy, that really took us by surprise. Here's some tensions that we didn't really recognize were out there. Um, the more I think they become better leaders and more informed. And I've, I've seen that certainly in the, in the defense and security context. And to the degree that we've run these exercises with corporate leaders, I think you've seen kind of an aha moment after they get a day into an exercise where they're mm-hmm. at to kind of step outside of their real world environment, embrace a scenario that maybe they hadn't thought about and actually start to, to, to live in that world, um, I think they, they begin to recognize that they need to be more creative, both in envisioning uh, potential problems and creating potential solutions. Okay. Interesting. Would you feel this is, or maybe a question for afterwards, whether you feel this is kind of a must for all leaders, especially with the increasing complexity of, of, of our world. But let's, let's keep that for the discussion. Um, Hajif, you're, you're into communications and marketing. Um, you, but, and, and you, you accommodate your service different kinds of organizations, right? Governments, corporates, not for profits. Um, what, what, what have you seen, uh, over the past year? Have you seen also differences, um, between the different, uh, uh, clients you have? Uh, do government organizations react differently? Uh, to an issue that we all saw happening, and uh, who was the best in in trust building? Uh, do, can, can you see certain red threats there? Thank you. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon, everybody. Good evening. Uh, thank yeah, you for yes. having me good on this session, you, yeah. Simone. And uh, yes, yeah, so I, I think uh, Simone, as you said, uh, I'm an entrepreneur. Uh, runs a company across four countries, about a hundred people. Work with a variety of clients from government to business to sort of startups and nonprofits. And, uh, you know, we also uh, advise a lot of clients on how, how do they communicate in, in terms of uncertainty. And particularly as an entrepreneur, uh, you know, our stock and trade is finding opportunity in uncertainty and in you know, changing environment. And that's something I've done for two plus decades. And one of the sort of most uh, important personal learnings for me has always been that uh, effective communication based on sound understanding of where you are at any given point of time uh, is very important because, you know, if you have people depending on you, like I have a team of 100 people spread across four countries, different, you know, with these COVID waves going up and down at different pace in each of these countries, uh, it's very hard Mm -hmm. to sort of come up with a unique single point policy to address this. And, And so what I have done since the beginning, uh, in fact, I think I'd shared this with you when we were sort of prepping for this call. We, uh, you know, actually did a complete work from home. Uh, and thankfully, our business is, some, uh, is a kind of business that people could work digitally and remotely from March 6th of last year. Uh, and the reason we did that that early compared to the countries which were sort of going into lockdown several weeks after that was I spent some time very early on 
uh, getting intel, talking to people in, in healthcare and in, in sort of epidemiology, looking at the data, because you know, I deal with the media a lot and they're not always right. And, and I was absolutely certain that they were not right because from friends who were running uh, sort of businesses that operate airports and things like that, I could hear horror stories coming out from China. And, and so we started prepping and communicating that uh, very early on. Uh, my team thought I was bat raving mad when we went work from home on March 6th, which was at least two weeks before I think uh, India went uh, into sort of lockdown, I think 10 days before the US decided to do that. Uh, and my biggest learning has been that communicate a lot, uh, way more than I, and we do sort of monthly communication. We were doing literally daily, weekly in the early days of the pandemic. We continue to do sort of bi-weekly, monthly calls and updates based on what we know at a particular time. And that has been very helpful because, you know, we, we talk to every person. We are not that large a company, so we can do that where I'm involved personally in the communication side. Uh, and in terms of the client side, one of the things we saw was a lot of them were trying to figure out what should they be doing. And our advice and counsel had uh, always been, you know, we drink our own Kool-Aid. So if we were doing something, we were sharing all of that information uh, effectively with the clients as well. And a lot of them came back and said, oh, great, this is awesome, because we actually they got to see some of that data that I had used to make, make decisions, right, from Johns Hopkins, from other epidemiologists that I started tracking. Uh, and, you know, Twitter was a great source to find some of these information, which I would not typically have seen uh, on uh, sort of traditional media channels uh, in terms of the early sort of kickoff. I know Jose mentioned uh, Black Swan. Uh, I follow uh, Nassim Taleb and, you know, he was one of the very early proponents of sort of lockdowns and things like that back in sort of late January, early February. Mm -hmm. uh, and when, when he saw what was happening in China. And I think that was uh, all helpful in terms of how we planned and communicated across the board. And so this still continues. You know, India just went through a horrific time in the last month, starting to ease off now. So uh, the idea is to kind of keep showing to the people that uh, at least both internally and with our clients that there is an end to to all of this at some point and if you look at it historically and yeah. see where uh, you know even the 1918 pandemic took a couple of years to sort through so i would say you know communicate yeah. communicate communicate yeah and also probably um, and i would like to hear a little bit from you afterwards uh, about the honesty of communications right yes, if you look absolutely. at india of course we have seen some issues um, Um, yes. have, by the prime minister having uh, large meetings, uh, not communicating honestly with the people, and and that that uh, led to enormous uh, problems in India, of course, and, and consequences. Uh, so, I'm, and and I would also like to hear whether you, all of you, have uh, communicated differently with your clients or advised them in a different way than you would have otherwise done um, to to help them restore confidence in their leadership. But first we have Andy, um, cognitive neuroscience, Andy. Can you tell us a little bit how, as a scientist, you, you look at this, how to restore trust? What did leaders wrong? What did they do well? What would you advise them? That's a really big question. Uh, yeah, of course, I, yeah, I we are the big I, I call myself an accidental academic. Here. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. <laughs> I, never yeah, that's, intended, that's, I never intended yeah. to do this. Um, but you, but you live in Switzerland, right? I, I, accidental I academics there are more, for most of us are very high level scientists. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, I mean, the basis of what, what I do on do is essentially look at the human brain and, and see what comes out of it. You know, and, and translating the, the science the hard science into, let's say, practical applications or understandable uh, words for our business leaders, you know, businesses and, and, and the general public. You know, there's, there's lots of things to, to talk about here. I think just, just back to kind of Nina's comment and, you know, the comments on predictability. Uh, the first thing to understand is the whole point of the brain is to build an operating model of the world. So it builds a virtual reality of the world and says, okay, this is how the world operates. That's what it does, and it's to lower surprise. There's a big, big, big theory in neuroscience, which is surprise minimization by one of the big, you know, the godfathers of, of neuroscience. So the, the brain is to build a predictive model of the world and lower your surprise. 
so you can operate in the world effectively. Because so that's the whole point of having a brain, you know. And we've been saying, you know, this kind of like, you know, I've been corporate education for what twenty, twenty five years now, you know. And in those twenty five years, we've always been talking about Vodka. Everyone always says, you know, has been, you know, we've talking about uncertainty for the last twenty, twenty five years. So it's not not new mm-hmm. the, the, this concept, but we always struggle with it. You know, and, and the reason we always struggle is the brain's not designed <laughs> to do that. The brain's designed <laughs> to, to to create some sort of predictability. And that's what every leader is trying to do. Every leader is trying to predict something to, to make decisions, to make investments and, you know, to, to move forward in life and obviously hopefully stay in their own positions <laughs> for the next five or ten years. So, so so that's the first thing. It's 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 a thing the brain does and will always do it. Now, of course, within that, there is a range of behaviors. So as Nina, Nina was saying, you know, there's, you know, there's concepts of uncertainty tolerance. Some people are better at it than other people. It's a natural personality trait. And of course, that can be trained as well to a certain extent, because if you're always in uncertainty, you'll be used to, you know, changing your behaviors. But one of the fundamental problems then is, is structural and structural in businesses, you know, big businesses. Uh, even though they talk about a lot of these concepts, and Harjit was talking about entrepreneurship, you know they've been talking about you know entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship for a long time, but they're not rewarded for entrepreneurship in in essence. So there's a fundamental problem between what the brain does and what leaders are doing. Um, when it comes to leadership, the other big thing I said is. Uh, and this is uh, the topic of communication that Harjit was talking about. I, you know, part of my thought is not how the leaders themselves respond, but how do they respond to the people? Because you've got a lot of people, you know, sometimes tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions in a case of, you know, prisons. You've got to engage their brains in this time of pandemic to engage in the right behaviors. So that's mm-hmm. a really important thing, you know, rather than say I, as a leader, I'm feeling uncertain, but I've got <laughs> a lot of people's brains to engage. And there's certain predictable patterns there. So, for example, when stress kicks in, we know from the brain that basically your prefrontal cortex, your logical, rational brain, shuts down <laughs> in a simple way. <laughs> yeah. So it's you know, sad enough. Yeah. So so basically, if you've got stress in the system, suddenly rationality goes out the window. So if you're a leader and you're communicating, you've got to really take this into account and be really clear how you communicate to people, either a large population who are not thinking rationally. They're not thinking logically, you know. So there's, there's some really important factors there. Um, the other factor is some things are going to cause stress. And we talked about stress of overwork, but you know, for example, the the, the stress of lockdown, you know, and this co- goes in hand in hand conspiracy theories. I, I recently wrote a detailed analysis of conspiracy theorists, but it goes hand in hand in that because as soon as you take away control, um, you actually trigger conspiracy theories because it's lack of control triggers conspiracy theories so there's things that are actually quite predictable uh that's again a lot of leaders haven't been on top of you know the, you know which is rise of conspiracies you know all the so frustration basically they didn't have they they were not well prepared they were not well the communication prepared. people, yeah, people communication. So, either. Yeah. You know, and this is why I said the first thing to think of in this situation, as as we said, really good communication, career, crystal clear, building trust, which means honesty. Uh, because if you're dishonest, you disrupt trust, and then that breaks so many barriers. But the other thing is the vision forward. You have to be looking forward, you know. And of course that's going to be a challenge to communicate sometimes, but if you're not thinking forward, you're just going to have a problem, you know. So, you know, and some of that is preempting what people are going to be doing. We know people are in stressful yeah. We know rationality is going to be shutting down. We know things like lockdown are going to stress people in different ways and not normally for the reasons we think of, you know. It's because, you know, taking away control has a stress response. So there's going to be a kickback at some stage. Mm-hmm. And also from a policy point of view, it's a question of how strict should those lockdowns be? You know, we've spoken about mental health, you know, it's been a big topic, um, which is why I'm thankful Switzerland didn't go through a hard lockdown. You know, we had a you know, soft lockdown. You could always go out. You could always have movements because that enables some sort of control, you know. Uh, and there's been, a, you know, I've seen a, a lack of thought of that at, at different levels. 
Another interesting yeah. point, just on corporate leadership. I'll just compare to the you know the financial crisis in two thousand eight. Oh, he's gone. Um, I hope he will come um, back. Ah, you you were gone for oh, like. Gone. Yeah, I just called myself for a moment. <laughs> But I'm talking to myself. I am. Ah, so yeah. corporate leadership. You were so corporate leadership. Yeah. yeah. So the interesting factor is we've measured stress in the workplace over the pandemic. In most multinational corporations, it's decreased. Sounds strange, you know, but you know th these are people. Let's say well-educated people in middle-aged people. You're not looking at you know crisis workers. You're not looking at workers in certain sectors which have been hit really badly. You know, classic multinationals. And it's because of leaders' response has been totally different. During the financial crisis, leaders responded by taking control. That, you know, said, oh, my God, you know, crisis, crisis, we have to take control, you know, which is an automatic response. So they take control and restrict autonomy and freedom of the workers and increase the stress of the workforce. In this, in the pandemic, they've had to do something else. <laughs> They've had to let go. <laughs> you know, uh -huh. they've, they've had to let go. So they've had to give autonomy and give freedom. So what actually happened is that, you know, the, the stress, the autonomy, the freedom and productivity has actually increased because senior leaders have had to control. It wasn't a conscious decision to let control say, you know, they say, oh, my God, we have to go to homework, you know, you know, they, they knew they had to do it. So it, it's interesting just the dynamics have been totally different between the financial crisis and the pandemic. And it's, and it's, it's actually ironically, you know, so, so less leadership, less leadership, better results. <laughs> yeah, you know, but that's just trust your people. It's a, yeah. it's basically uh, you could you could think of, of of part of empowerment of your of your people, trust Absolutely. and empowerment. I talk to people from education, educational mm -hmm. circles, and they said the same, because uh, they had to reorganize the entire educational system, uh, 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 online schooling, etc. And leadership had to let go because they couldn't control them. Absolutely. And they told me exactly the same thing, basically, a inter very interesting concept. So if you think of um, re-educating um, leaders to cope with greater uncertainty, what, what so for the future, to, to do things better for the future, to, to get a learning curve, what, what would be the advice of you? And, and I mean, uh, I, I invite all of you to, to speak, of course, right? I've been speaking a while, so I'll let the others <laughs> jump in. Who? I, I would say, I mean, let's let's start with challenging assumptions, right? So let's start with saying that maybe um, there are ways for you to think differently. Take the assumptions that you've had about the future and uh, think differently about them. Make new ones, challenge them, make sure that they're the right ones, because it seems to me that that's that's part of the challenge. The part of the problem is the disconnect between the expectation and the reality. Um, and if you are actively, and again, you can't perpetually challenge your assumptions, but actively, uh, sort of iteratively challenging your assumptions about the future, then they may over time change, sometimes subtly, sometimes less so. But I think having a structured uh, way to say, are we thinking about this problem the right way? Are we thinking about our assumptions and about these trends? Uh, is there something that we're missing? Why are we thinking like this? Why aren't we thinking a different way? Having structured means to do that on a regular basis, I think it can be a, a good first step. Necessary, but not sufficient. <laughs> yeah. um, to start to prepare leaders uh, for the for incorporating uncertainty. Yeah. Do, do you feel that that their, uh, their leaders have learned something of this crisis? Would you feel that they have been basically also re-educating re themselves? That they have gained better insights. Have they? Are they doing things differently? Harjeev, I think you told me that, or, or maybe it was Jose that people that they were thinking more uh, purpose oriented uh, compared to like one year ago or like eighteen months ago. Uh, I I think. I am hearing a lot of CEOs, uh, and partly this is driven by their teams, right? That uh, one question that has arisen over the last 13, 14 months is, 
every individual has had to really look after themselves and their families first before even the companies that they work for, organizations that they are part of. And and that has also created a lot of questions in the mind of all of these individuals uh, across the world that, uh, you know, uh, is this the right company? Uh, are they, uh, you know, doing the right thing by me or not? And we're seeing some of this as... Uh, you know, companies coming back into the offices, uh, at least in New York here, things have sort of opened up completely. Uh, there is a lot of hesitancy by, uh, you know, employees to get back into the workspace uh, for, for all good reasons. Uh, and leaders have to address that uh, because, you know, they have to have the ability to gauge where that fear is. You know, we're not 100% vaccinated across any of the countries. I don't think we'll get there at any point. Uh, soon uh, and and different countries will have to take their different courses but leaders have to understand mm -hmm. that there is this humongous fear that has to be addressed andy talked about this you know you have to communicate to the fears of your of the uh, employees individuals and team members because if you don't do that uh, you're ignoring uh, and me the purpose driven piece comes from understanding that and i think that's important it's interesting. Uh, I see here that Lisa has uh, Lisa Senhauer has a remark uh, in in the chat. Uh, she says, "I sense a lot of pressure to go back to work now, and this is increasing yeah. the pressure immensely. The companies are taking back control and taking it away from their employees. So this doesn't uh, sound like re-educating themselves. It's like re-educating mm -hmm. back to uh, how it was, right?" Uh, that would be a very sorry situation. And uh, um, let's let's. Do you believe that um, workers are more empowered now to say no to their leaders? Now they have kind of smelled also a partial freedom, the opportunity to be more creative and 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 uh, also organize their own time. How how do you uh, feel just, about this? Just based on observation. On mm -hmm. this is very anecdotal because. Obviously, you try to, to you extrapolate from your experiences and people you know around. But I think it's true that it's taking more effort now to bring people back to work than before. I mean, people have changed their lives somehow in their family lives and, you know, and households and so forth um, in a way that now they think, uh, I'm not sure this is better than before, but I'm used to this now. And going back to the office uh, feels like a uh, unnecessary ill somehow and, and, necessary and evil. This is happening and i would say this is happening more in larger companies than in smaller companies uh where the role of the individual is perceived as less kind of like vital to the machinery so people start to feel more when they are not as needed as they were before and therefore if i stay home what's the problem um, and also, and there is definitely a timing issue here. The longer you've been out of the office, the more resistance you have to go back to the office. I think that's in generally in general true, uh, but I'm not sure it's good. I don't think we should read this as, okay, uh, we empowered the workforce and therefore they're more productive and this is good. It's just that people kind of like get used to the new situation and, and we need to probably readjust somehow to the new generation and 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 your and, and your question simone i'm not sure the leaders really have learned i mean they probably have learned many things from this obviously but i'm not sure they know exactly where we're heading towards and and where the company should be towards coming. in very simple things like for example large software companies today are questioning do we need to travel so much because 60 percent of my workforce were basically the marketing people or the commercial people and all of a sudden, I realized that last year we spent half, half the cost, or we had half the cost, uh, and basically the year was pretty good. Um, why should we rethink about these travel policies in general? Um, and I don't think they have an answer because they, they don't really know. Um, when we look back into previous crisis, and, 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 and the most obvious parallelism is probably on the political side, more the company side, because, because companies have changed a lot. But political world has changed less to some extent. You go back to the first half of the 20th century and you see that in this type of situations where uncertainty is so obvious, when people are scared, uh, when the world is upside down, um, both the great leaders emerge and the horrible leaders emerge. Horrible leaders meaning the people who have simple answers to difficult uh, problems, 
these people start to pop up. And it had happened before, probably, the COVID crisis, but now it's more obvious than ever, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it, maybe it's, it says something about the, uh, the different sites that people are on. They're more split than ever, maybe. Andy, you wanted to say something. Yeah, I was coming back to we were into the political topic, which is another fascinating topic Finally. of the brain now. But um, come back to this this workplace, and I'm, I'm doing some work with a big multinational there, and, and their transition back to you know to, to to the workplace, and they have like many companies now have said a hybrid working model, you know, which is you know mm -hmm. previously standard would have been five days in the office, so people did work from home every now and again, but the standard, of course, was still mostly in the office. Now uh, the same default standard, three days in the office, two days at home, and you vary from that according to personal circumstances. Now, there's, there's a couple of interesting aspects around this. You know, one is back to have leaders learnt on it. Um, and the one thing I've spoken about is contextual anchors in the memory. So your memory your and behaviours are anchored by certain contexts. So you go back into the office and you tend to suddenly start doing your old behaviours just because the whole environment, the whole setup just unconsciously anchors you back into these old behaviors. So the old behaviors are at risk uh, uh, coming coming back into place. Um, the second is, you know, this, this benefit. And, you know, what we've said to the office is understand and use the office effectively. It's really good for some things, you know, and it's not good for other things, you know. Uh, and that's why we've seen increased productivity because it's not good for some things. You know, people have had now more efficient meetings. You know, not being able to travel between meetings, not having this whole travel thing. You know, as you know, I've spoken to senior executives. Oh God, why did I travel so much previously? I've just got so much more time. But I'm still busy, but I just feel it's productive busy. You know, so you got a bunch of things. But there's a couple of interesting things which I think will be long-term impacts on businesses, and that is, you know, the concept of bonding. You know, and this happens in person. If you build different relationships with people, you have contact to different people in the business. Even as random fleeting walking past someone in the corridor, you know, triggers them. Oh, that's Andy. He's the guy who does that. These contacts are all slowly eroded over time. And that leads also to things like a slow erosion of trust in the organization. Because if you have this compact, you see the people, you know the people, you meet the people, you chat to the people, you chat about sport, you chat about family, you know, different people, random people, you build all this whole cultural connection to the business. And that's going to erode over time if you don't have offices. Now, of course, that can work. Organizations have it. But that, what I'm saying is leaders should be very conscious of what's going to happen because some things, as I, as I said previously, are predictable. You know, if we know how human beings behave and the brain behaves, we can predict some of these behaviors going forward. And we know there is going to be some of that happening. And some of those are underestimated or unthought about, you know, which is, you know, you know, the classic water cooler conversations or just random things happening in, in corridors and so on and so forth. Do, do you also feel that? <clears throat> oh no, sorry. First date, please go ahead, Ted. Yes, yeah, so sorry. Just, just very quickly on the topic oh. of of what leaders have learned. I, I think actually some, and again, I spend probably more of my time in the government context, but, but certainly also work in private with private sector organizations. But in the government context, one thing that I I think is a risk is that. Um, all of this heavy lifting of adaptation and change and res response to COVID and its uh, attached uh, implications will, will be exhausting, right? And so the risk is, well, we, we did that, we changed, um, and you lose your vigilance and you stop thinking about what the next risk will be. Instead, you spend all of your time, energy, and effort responding to the one that just happened, which is important, of course, to get that right. But um you know, I see it, uh, I've seen it for a long time in the security context. I mean, right now there's a lot of focus on bio threats as there should be. There should have been a long time ago. So now it's caught up. But, you know, you can already see other threats like cyber threats that are are uh, are shooting up uh, as a result. So, you know, the, the whack-a-mole uh, component of this is something that I think is a risk because it's hard to change. You get tired and you think, well, I, we just did change. We have to keep changing. <laughs> So, um, so anyway, that's just I just wanted to highlight. No, but that. Is, is that a kind of narrow perspective? So it's, it's flipping from one issue to the other. 
Yes, I think I think that's one of the great things and also the risks of these crisis moments is it does narrow the focus on the problem at hand. Uh, but by doing that, maybe you solve the problem at hand and you keep solving it rather than thinking about what the next one might yeah. be. Yeah, because if you look at the where the pandemic comes from and mm-hmm. and the the predictions as to pandemics that have been on the table for a long time and for decades already people have warned about pandemics and it's about sure. a larger picture in the end huh yes. it's about uh, the relationship between mankind and nature uh, mm-hmm. animals plants you know the globe uh, yeah. among others about inequality issues etc about uh, gender equality because all uh, uh, all those issues have had an uh, an, an aggravating effect on on the pandemic uh, so so basically the bigger picture should be kept in 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 mind and what i hear from you guys is that it doesn't seem to really happen but andy maybe you can shed yeah, some should. light on on that uh, on the issue as well and except for what you wanted to say anyway yeah well exactly that and again it's it's just brain response reaction so the brain is designed to respond <laughs> to, to 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 biggest current threats you know the the, the brain you know, we obviously have this ability to project into the f- future, but if you said on average, what does the brain do? On average, the brain responds to the moment, you know, and threats have a particularly big response to the brain. So, you know, uh, the, the current, th- and this is what I've said all the time, you know, also in previous crises, you, know, you focus on the current crisis, uh, but are you already thinking of the next crisis? But again, uh, in government leadership, you know, uh, in the public space and corporate space. I'm not sure. I'm not sure we're really there yet. You know, I think we're probably better than we were 20 or 30 years ago, maybe. But uh, I'm not sure we're there. As we know, pandemic has been, I've heard people talking about pandemics for the last 20 years. We know it's been on the books. But again, as I said, we didn't have an operating model, certainly in the Western world, uh, for dealing with pandemics. And that's why it took everyone by surprise. Yeah, so I'm I'm not that comfortable with we're primed to deal with the present. Yeah. It doesn't sound very encouraging, to be honest. It sounded the diplomatic uh, language was saying that nobody has learned anything. But, but let's hope for the best. Um, so so maybe it's I see it's seventeen twelve. We have another full three minutes to go. Um, Please take the floor and tell me in like one, two or three words what would be your um, advice if you think of re-educating leaders to pick up uh, uh, and working with uncertainty and pandemics and whatever you have more better than they did so far. I'll say don't challenge the scenario. Um, this is something we lead off every war game that we ever get into because there is always at least one, maybe a dozen who say <laughs> that could never happen. And so we start every game by saying, don't challenge the scenario. It could happen. Um, and I think that's something that leaders should, should take into account. I, I think that's a super interesting one because you saw many of the leaders, the, especially the authoritarian ones, who challenged the scenario all the time and are still doing it to a certain extent, right? They sure. just don't believe the scenario. And we are lucky that COVID is not more serious than it basically turned out to be, right? It could have been much, much worse in terms of uh, all kinds of effects. Sure. Um, Jose, a wise word from your, from your side. Give us your all. That's very challenging, Simone. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that uh, the most important thing is to realize that things will get back to where they were before somehow. Obviously, things change, but um, I think overreacting to the changes that this will come along is probably also not totally correct. I think that many things that we think are gone will come back and and therefore um, what we learned 20 30 years ago 10 years ago will still be valid in many respects and and eventually things will come back to what we believe to be more 
kind of like uh, normality. Although, as I said before, okay. don't forget that normality will never exist as such. Yeah. Okay. Thanks so much, Ashif. I I think the biggest failure uh, in the last 13 months has been that at global level, each country basically did what they wanted to do. And I think the trillions of dollars that each economy across from the Western world and even, uh, you know, the developing world have wasted trying to solve a problem that could have been done cheaper, better, had the leadership come together. And I think that to me was a failure that we have to learn from if the world has to survive the next 20 years, because we still have climate change to deal with. Uh, and, and so I, I think that lack of understanding of, okay. you know, questioning different priorities. I mean, each country is doing mm -hmm. their own thing. And and honestly, the, we could have solved this better because the world has smart people, uh, you know, bring bring the brightest together. And maybe there's a mechanism